All right, so uh, this is section 4.2, which is trigonometric functions, specifically the unit circle, how they're relating to the unit circle. So 4.2 covers um, identifying a unit circle and describing its relationship to real numbers, evaluating trigonometric functions using the unit circle, using domain and period to evaluate sine and cosine functions, and use a calculator to evaluate trigonometric functions. So hopefully you have a calculator handy. Um, I do have 89 with me and my um, TIX2 thing so that um, when we get to that part with the calculator, we can talk about what buttons to hit and all that. All right. So starting with the unit circle. So the unit circle is a circle with radius one that is centered at the origin. So it's called the unit circle because the radius is one unit because we don't actually have units to our circle. So um, the unit circle is just always a circle with radius one. When we refer to angles on the unit circle, we're always starting at the horizontal axis and going and usually starting on like the positive horizontal axis, so the positive x values, and then your angle is either going up or it's going down. If it's going up, we are moving counterclockwise, and that is the standard angle. So most, for some reason, I don't know who decided this, but somebody decided that we're gonna go counterclockwise when we're doing angles on the unit circle. If you're going clockwise, so that means you're going down, from that initial um, horizontal, that's an, considered a negative angle. So going counterclockwise is positive angle. Um, going clockwise is a negative angle. <clears throat> so getting used to that is a little tricky. If you think about it as you're moving either to the positive values or the negative values, that can sort of help you. Um, if you're thinking in terms of y values, that will help you determine if it's a positive or negative angle. Um, and then we're basically looking at the distance between 1, 0, and then some point if you're kind of rotating that segment along your, your circle with a radius of 1. So since the unit circle has a radius of 1, the equation for circumference is 2 pi r. So that means our circumference of the circle is just 2 pi. And that's where radians come from. Why is, OK, something is not displaying here correctly. Because there's supposed to be a picture on the right, not a copy of the exact same text. <laughs> OK, hold on. Let me see what is going on with my PowerPoint. Because um, that is really strange. I don't know what happened there. It's somehow, that is so weird. Because I, OK. I'm going to fix that PowerPoint. That is so weird. I made it this morning and everything looked fine. Um, I don't know why the picture I wanted is not showing up. Okay. And I had it all set up nicely and now, okay. Well, let me share my screen again. Okay, so this is what you were supposed to see on the right, not a copy of the same text. <laughs> um, but so our unit circle has a radius of 1, so it's 2 pi for the circumference. And then t is our variable for what we measure, um, sort of what we're referencing from. So you might have noticed that on the previous slide, we had t labeled there. And so... Um, we can label this value as t. And so measure of t is basically the proportion of the circumference it covers. So we can think of this segment as measuring t. And so I've drawn that at about 1. Um, let's see, if we have the circle go into fourths, I divided the fourth again. So this is about 1 eighth 
of the circumference. So t would be equal to 1 eighth of 2 pi, which reduces to pi over 4. So we'd say that measure of t is pi over 4. So it's basically the proportion of the, the whole circumference. And that's where radians come from. So when we're measuring radians, we're bas basically looking at what proportion of the circle is covered. Basically, if you're moving from our horizontal and then we're moving in the standard direction, which would be up and counterclockwise. And then that proportion of your circumference gives you your radians. So each value of t then is also corresponding to that angle. And so that angle is basically the same thing as that measurement. So that angle is the same as the radian. So uh, for that same one that I drew, the angle would be pi over 4. Um, you can use the same idea when you're doing uh, degrees. You're looking at, okay, a circle has 360 degrees. So if we have one eighth of that in our little segment there, then one eighth of 360 degrees would give you um, what the angle is in degrees. So I should be able to just do that in my head. That's 45 degrees. So um, that's sort of how you get radians and degrees kind of they, they compare. And that distance t is we call that the arc length, basically how long that distance is that you've traveled on the circle. And so that formula is S equals R theta. So S stands for the arc length. I don't know why they use S. Um, it's really confusing because usually when you're writing, that looks like a five. So it's really annoying. <laughs> and then the R, so the radius, and then theta. And so that's what that measurement is. If I, this, if I highlight it sort of in yellow, that's the arc length which is essentially equivalent to T when you have a unit circle. So if you don't have a unit circle, arc length is not the same as T, but on the unit circle, they are the same thing. Was there an equation where you, when you did the degree formula, I mean, looking at it, I can visually tell it should be a 45 degree angle, but. <clears throat> I, I just look at what proportion I have of the whole circle that I've that I've uh, highlighted there. So and you took an eighth of 360 degrees to get to 45. Yes, and, that's okay. exactly right. So it's yeah, it's just knowing your proportions. Okay. Um, and then making the assumption that I did draw that halfway between <laughs> the right. for the the um, quarter segment there, which was my intention there. So with that background, that brings us to the trig functions here. So there are six trig functions, and I'm going to zoom in. So most people have heard of sine, cosine, and tangent. So sine is abbreviated S-I-N, cosine is cos, and then tangent is tan. And um, when you're on a unit circle, you actually have XY values. And so you can use those ordered pairs on the unit circle to give you your sine, cosine, and tangent values. So what I always remember is that your sine is always the y value. Cosine is always the x value. And then I never remember that tangent is y over x. Um, I just remember it as sine over cosine. Oops, I was on the pen. That's how I remember is sine over cosine. But if you think of, well, you know, with slope, we always have a y on top. So if you just think of that the y is on top, that can help you remember that tangent is the y value over the x value. Then um, our reciprocal function, so cosecant is the opposite of sine, so that's 1 over y. Secant is the opposite of cosine, so that's 1 over x. And then cotangent is the opposite of tangent, so it's a reciprocal, so now it's x over y. If you're going to take notes somewhere, definitely write these down. If nothing else, remember which ones are reciprocals. Um, I always remember the reciprocals because if you have sine, your reciprocal has to have a co, which gives you cosecant. Cosine already has a co, so that means the reciprocal is secant. And then tangent and cotangent, those are a lot easier to remember. 
So that's how I remember which ones are the reciprocal. And then as long as I remember how to define sine, cosine, and tangent, I can remember the other three. So that's just really important, something to memorize, especially when you're going on to pre-calc, or not pre-calc, you're in pre-calc, when you're going on to calculus, uh, you actually do a lot of things <coughs> with trig functions and knowing the definitions can make your life easier. Good to know, because that's next semester. Oh, yes, yes. So um, you're going to be using calculus is really based in algebra. It's a lot of algebra, but with some new techniques. So it will make your life easier if you have all of these basics down, because then you won't be worrying so much about this stuff, and you can work, worry about the new techniques. So my first example here, um, evaluating the trig functions based off of an ordered pair on the unit circle. So basically using these definitions because you're given an ordered pair, so you have your X and Y. So you're just literally plugging them in in order to evaluate these. So on our picture, they've shown us what T is. So T is that um, section going counterclockwise, and so our angle there is theta. We don't care what that actual angle measure is because as long as you're given an ordered pair, you can find the trig functions, regardless of what the angle is. So um, just to remind me that sine is always y, oops, and help to just write sine and then cosine is over or always x. So if that helps, you can just write them sort of on your graph so you can remember which one goes with which. So our sine of t, which is our angle value um, in radians, we don't know what it is, is just the y value. So out of that ordered pair, that is 17 over 15. And since we're doing all the six trig functions, we can also do the reciprocal. So the reciprocal of sine is cosecant. So I was going to spell out cosecant, but it's SC is just the reciprocal. So that is 17 over 15. Next one is cosine. So cosine is the X value. So you just read that off of the ordered pair. That's negative 8 over 17. And then the reciprocal of cosine is secant. So it would be negative 17 over 8. Then the last one is tangent. So when I write these things this way, it's actually, it also helps me remember that tangent is sine over cosine because I've literally written my sine on top of my cosine. So um, this is just a way that helps me remember. <laughs> That's that a good universe. Yeah, because it's like, oh, okay, I already got one on the, oh. so we've got these fractions. So it's going to be 15 over 17 over negative 8 over 17. So we're dividing by fractions, so that means multiplying by the reciprocal. So that's going to be 15 over 17 times negative 17 over 8. So then the 17s in this case cancel out. And so I'm left with a negative 15 over 8. And then to find tangent, cotangent is the reciprocal of that. And I gave myself an extra slide because I knew that I was going to run out of room. So cotangent is just the reciprocal. So the reciprocal of tangent. So tangent was negative 15 over 8. So cotangent is negative 8 over 15. So as long as you have an ordered pair, you don't even need to pull out a calculator to find these trig values because it's basically giving you the ordered pair. And this is because if, if I drew, I'm going to do this in a different color here. If I drew a triangle here. <laughs> It's a radius of 1, and if you're thinking about it, it's always the opposite over something. So like the sine is, if I'm looking at my angle here that I'm kind of coloring in, the opposite over the hypotenuse, because 
a lot of people have heard of SOHCAHTOA. So you're just dividing by one. So it's just the Y value divided by one. So that's why it's just the Y value. Um, so the whole reason that these trig functions operate this way is because we're, our hypotenuse is one for whatever triangle we drew. If you had something that was not a unit circle, then you can't use these identities. So um, these equations would not work because these only work when you're on the unit circle. So if you're not on a unit circle, you can still find your trig functions. You just have to literally draw the triangle and then use like the Pythagorean theorem or SOHCAHTOA to figure out what your missing parts are. Are there any questions? Not yet. Good. <laughs> I'm trying to make this as easy as possible. <laughs> so, um, it's really important when you have the unit circle to know the angles, to know their conversion between the radian measure and the degree measure, and then to know the ordered pairs. You can derive the ordered pairs, and if my video that's about unit circle and the right triangle, I show how to do that. Um, you have to use SOHCAHTOA and the Pythagorean theorem and things like that in order to derive it. Um, oh, back when I was taking pre-calc, I had to memorize this thing, but there's no reason that you guys have to memorize it. So I would print it out, and actually I emailed everybody out through an announcement, a PDF to a file um, with a neater version of this image. So I would just print it out and use it for reference, so that way you don't have to memorize all of these ordered pairs. Um, you can just reference your, your little chart or your unit circle and then read it off of there. I'll save you a lot of time. So example two is I'm going to show how you can do that. And of course, I have a really tiny version that I had to fit here. But we're going to evaluate the six trig functions at t equals 2 pi over 3. So when it says t, we're assuming we're the radians. So that's 2 pi over 3 radians. So I look for where that is on my unit circle. And that's here. So the angle we're looking at is this angle right here. So T is this arc length that I am coloring in. 120 degrees. Yep. <coughs> so knowing that, we want that ordered pair, and then we're going to use that ordered pair to figure out our six trig functions. So sine of T, and you could write actually sine of 2 pi over 3, is always the y value. So that gives us the square root of 3 over 2. Then the reciprocal of sine is cosecant. So cosecant of 2 pi over 3 is 2 over the square root of 3. Now, we don't like to have square roots in the denominator. So we want to rationalize the denominator, and we do that by multiplying the top and the bottom by the square root. So that would be multiplying the top and the bottom by the square root of 3. So that gives us 2 times the square root of 3. And then the square root of 3 times the square root of 3 is just 3. The square roots basically cancel. So the cosecant value is 2 square root of 3 over 3. I'm going to just highlight these because they, they start kind of getting lost when you start doing all this work. <laughs> so next is cosine. So the cosine of 2 pi over 3 is the x value of that ordered pair, so that's negative 1 half. And the so secret would be negative 2 over 1. That's exactly that's right. So that's just negative 2. So that one's nice and easy. Um, it's always when you start doing those square roots, and that comes from the Pythagorean theorem, that's where things get nasty. So now tangent is sine over cosine. So that's the square root of 3 over 2 over negative 1 half. So that we have the square root of 3 over 2, and we're multiplying by the reciprocal. So it's negative 2 over 1. The 2's cancel, and we're left with negative square root of 3. three yep. 
So the cotangent would be negative one. Well, it'd be it actually because you'd have to turn around have to and rationalize. Flip, uh, rationalize it. So it'd be yep. negative square root of three again. Um, doing that right? no, I'm, I'm not doing exactly. that in my head. So I had <laughs> yeah. That, so. See, that's why I don't do these in my head because that I know I'm going to mess it up. Uh, <laughs> I always have to write these down. So our tangent was negative square root of three. So we have negative one over the square root of three. So now I need to multiply the top and the bottom by the square root of three. So that gives us negative square root of three over three. Over three, yeah. Yeah. There we go. Yeah, don't try to do these in your head. No. <laughs> it's very easy to make mistakes there. And even when I'm doing it on paper, like the next problem, I was doing it this morning, and I'm like, did I do that right? Like, I was like, too many things canceled. That doesn't seem right. Right, yeah. <laughs> so, That's why I get to reduce my mind assignments sometimes. I yeah, because it's wrote it out. Oh. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> this is why I am a stickler to showing all of your math. Plus, it helps me figure out what you did. Especially right. if you have really bizarre things. <laughs> and then with, with this week in particular, there are multiple ways to solve these problems. So it's even more important to show what you, what you did so that I know which method you did if I'm trying to troubleshoot what were, went wrong. Okay. So example three here. Um, now I'm giving us a negative. So I'm going to show what the negative does. So the six trig functions at t equals negative pi over four. So that just means we're going down clockwise and we're going, rotation. yeah, we're going the clockwise rotation. So let me actually skip to, let me go to back to the big one. So that so would we're going flip the values then. It would be like negative square root of two over two and. Yes. So normally pi over four would value, be. I guess. Yeah, no, pi over 4 is up there, but now we're going in the opposite direction. So now it's going to be the same as 7 pi over 4. So we're going to be looking at square root of 2 over 2 and negative square root of 2 over 2. So when you flip it, the y gets flipped in the other direction. <clears throat> right, so we're down at the basically quadrant 4. That's exactly right. Positive x, but negative y. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, so I'm going to actually, we're down, down here. We're at square root of 2 over 2 and negative square root of 2 over 2, just so we have that picture there. And that's why I like having a reference for the unit circle so that you don't have to try to memorize all these. So sine of negative pi over 4. So sine is the y value, so that's going to be negative square root of 2 over 2. So the reciprocal of sine, that's where we're going to have to do some math. So I'm actually going to do this underneath only because I drew my picture. Now I don't have the space there. I should have thought ahead about where I was putting my picture. Um, so the reciprocal of sine is cos cosecant. So that would be a negative 2 over the square root of 2. So this is where we have to multiply by the square root of 2 on the top and the bottom. And this is where I was like, I think I canceled too much, but I didn't. It's correct. <laughs> so on the top, so we have that negative 2 square root of 2. And then square root of 2 times the square root of 2 is 2. So actually, the 2s cancel. So the cosecant value is just negative square root of 2. Let's just highlight these. So next is cosine. So then cosine of negative pi over 4 is the x value, so that's square root of 2 over 2. Now luckily, because all that's different between the sine and the cosine is the sine, the secant, which is the reciprocal, will just be a positive square root of 2. So we can just use the property that they basically have the same numbers, and we don't have to do any extra work there because we already did the work. Hopefully that makes sense to you guys. Yes. Good. And then the last one is the tangent and cotangent. So I'm going to do those on the next slide here. So tangent of negative pi over 4. 
So it's sine over cosine. So our sine is negative square root of 2 over 2 over, and then the cosine is square root of 2 over 2. So we could go through all the work, but notice that they're the same thing. So it's just you're going to get 1, with an, but we have that negative. So this comes out to negative 1. So the cotangent would be 1 then. Cotangent is actually still negative 1 because when you're taking the reciprocal, you have the same sign. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's a very, a lot of people when they take the reciprocal, they want to change the sign as well. And I just did it. <laughs> they want to change the sign, but you're not changing the sign. You're just changing the number itself and flipping it. And so in this case, because we have 1, they're both going to be the same thing. 1 over 1 is always 1 over 1. Yep. <clears throat> Any questions? Not yet. Okay. Okay, so now the domain of sine and cosine. And this is um, less important for this section. It's more important when we're solving equations that deal with uh, trig functions. But it is important to know for now. Uh, the domain is all real numbers. It just means you can plug anything into a trig function. And that's because your input is t. And so t is just your distance around the circle, which is a real number. And you can travel the circle as many times as you want in any direction. So that's how we get all real numbers, because you can basically travel that circle an infinite amount of times. And you can go in the positive version, or you can go in the negative version. So that's how we get the domain is all real numbers. And then because you can revolve it, you're constantly, if I'm starting, let's see, if, if I'm here at pi over 4, and then I want to go back to pi over 4, I'm just adding another circle to it. I'm going a full circumference, so I'm adding 2 pi. So each time you go around to go back to the same spot, you're adding 2 pi. So that's where all of these plus 2 pi's come from because these give you equivalent angles. So like when I did 0, 0 and 2 pi, they'll give the same answers for sine and cosine because they are equivalent. Pi and 3 pi give the same answer. Um, and you can test this out on your calculator when we get to the calculator part. So you can get the same answer for sine and cosine as long as they are all, you're just adding pi over 2 to this thing. So this is what we call periodicity, basically. I should have actually flip flopped my slides now that I'm, I'm thinking about it. Um, I will actually skip to that slide and then go back to my range slide. So um, that's periodic, which basically means that you can keep, you, you're getting a pattern of answers and they keep repeating. So that's what we mean by periodic. Um, and so that number, that value that you can add where you get the same answer that you started with, that is called the period. So for sine and cosine, the period is 2 pi. You add 2 pi, you get back to where you began. So we're going to use that fact. But before we do, I'm just going to talk about the range. So while the input to sine and cosine is your distance around the unit circle, so that's all real numbers, your range is not all real numbers because those are based off of the outputs. And so you have to look at sine and cosine as whether x or y. So sine is the y value. So the y values are only between negative 1 and 1 when you're looking at your unit circle. And then cosine is all the x values, which are between negative 1 and 1. So when we're thinking about trig functions, it gets confusing because your input is the angle. And then the output is like an x or y value. So it's not like your input's x, your output is y. Trig functions are a little different, where you're inputting some <coughs> value, some angle around the circle, and then you're getting output like an ordered pair or some number from there. So it's a little weird. It takes some getting used to think about that. And, okay, now the last thing before I get into my, my next few examples, so even and odd trig functions. So 
this isn't this is just a little handy trick so, so cosine and secant are considered even functions so what that means is that if you plug in a negative angle it's the same as having the positive angle out so if we have that negative pi over 4 example so this is pi over 4 and this is negative pi over 4 is our angles we were at square root of 2 over 2 this is also square root of 2 over 2 and then the negative angle was at square root of 2 over 2 negative square root of 2 over 2 so for cosine the x values are the same so those are considered even functions because their x values are the same when you have a positive versus a negative version of the angle. Odd functions are where you get the opposite. So sine is an odd function because the negative version of the angle has the opposite sine. So pi over 4 had a square root of 2 over 2 for sine, the y value. But for negative pi over 4, it was the opposite sine. It was a negative square root of 2 over 2. So that's considered an odd function because the y changed from a positive to a negative um, when you plugged in a negative value. So this kind of helps you in knowing this. We could have that pi over 4 example. If we didn't know where negative pi over 4 was, if we knew what pi over 4 was, then we could just know that, okay, my y value has to be negative. So you can use this fact if you don't have the entire unit circle. And this is what I mean about having different, different ways to do the problem. Because if I go back to this one here, we looked at our unit circle to figure out where negative pi over 4 was and then got our ordered pair. And knowing the fact that, um, you know, sine and cosine, that whether they're even or odd, you can use that fact and um, go straight to the ordered pair without having to go back to your unit circle. That's probably the same amount of work, but it's just an alternate way to do the problem. Does that make sense? Uh, yeah, I think so. <clears throat> In other words, on that previous example you had, knowing that... Yeah, if I, if I had on, known only what pi over 4 was, I could have, without looking at the circle, gone in the opposite direction and said, okay, the cosine, which is the x value, needs to stay the same because it's an even function um, that comes from this right here. And then the sine has this negative, so it's the opposite, and that's the y. So I could have gotten that ordered pair from these two facts rather than looking at the circle. Ah, uh, okay. So that's why it's like there's multiple ways to figure these things out. <laughs> okay, so that brings us to, I have three more examples. Um, so this one is evaluating using the period of the function. So cosine of 3 pi. So when you're looking at the unit circle, you're just given everything between 0 and 2 pi. So if you have something that's outside of that range, you can use the period, the fact that it repeats every 2 pi, to put it back in that range. So we do that either by adding 2 pi or subtracting 2 pi. If we're given a negative angle, we usually add 2 pi until we get a positive angle. So you can continually add 2 pi because it just keeps circling back to the same thing. And you just keep doing that until you have a number between 0 and 2 pi that is on the unit circle. So that negative pi over 4, if you add 2 pi to that, and so 2 pi, I have to have a common denominator, so that's 8 pi over 4. That tells you that's the same angle as 7 pi over 4. And so mm -hmm. you could use that. And if we go back to our unit circle, or I don't want this one, I want the other one I drew on. Um, I kind of covered it up, but see, that's the 7 pi over 4. Yeah, 315 degrees. Mm -hmm. So that's a third way that you can find these things. So <laughs> there's multiple ways to do this. 
So if you have a negative angle, I usually add 2 pi so that I can get the positive version and then look on the unit circle. Now if you have something here like cosine of 3 pi, 3 pi is not on our typical unit circle because it's greater than 2 pi. So you can subtract 2 pi and that gives you pi. So that tells you that the cosine, yeah. yep, the cosine of 3 Neither pi is exactly one, the same. And then cosine of pi, that is negative 1 and 0, if you're looking at the unit circle. And cosine is the x value, so that would give us negative 1. So is 3 pi also the same way of saying 540 degrees? Yes. You would have gone one full rotation and another Yeah, 360 plus the, the 180. <clears throat> yeah, well, so we usually do things in terms of radians and not degrees. Um, so if it does not have the degree symbol, assume it's in radian mode. And so most of the time you're going to want to have your calculator in radian mode. The most common error people getting the wrong answer is their calculator's in the wrong mode. So... Always assume something is in radians. That's just, um, it's a lot easier to work with for mathematicians than working with degrees. It just tends to work out a little nicer. So next one here, I have 9 pi over 4. So 8 pi over 4 is equal to 2 pi. So this is something that's, again, bigger than 2 pi. So I want to subtract pi from 9 pi over 4 so that I can get it into my reference circle. So I'm just subtracting pi over 4, which leaves me 1 pi over 4, so just pi over 4. So that means the sine of 9 pi over 4 is the same answer as the sine of pi over 4 which we have now found that value multiple times now, and that is square root of 2 over 2. Are there any questions? That's because sine is the y value. Yes. Maybe if you think about it in an alphabetical order. If you're looking at x and y, cosine and sine, cosine comes before sine alphabetically, and x comes before y alphabetically. That might be a good okay. way to do it. I yeah. just made that up, and that works really nice. Yeah, I like <laughs> Whatever that. works, yeah. <laughs> okay. That's why you've got negative 1 for the cosine. Yeah. All yep. right. Okay. I'm on the same page in the same book. Good. All right, example five here. So now this is a little different. Use the fact that the sine of negative t is equal to 3 over 8 to evaluate the, the following. Sine of t and cosecant of negative t. So this brings us to our even and odd functions. So sine is odd, which means that the sine changes when you change it. <laughs> okay, too many words. Sign S-I-N-E and sign S-I-G-N. <laughs> so we look at this visually. Sign of a negative angle is going down. So if you're looking at the positive version of angle, it's going up and sign is that Y value. So it's the opposite sign of whatever you got. So if sign of negative T is 3 A's, then sine of t must be negative 3 a's. So those need to be opposite. When you're flipping from the negative angle to the positive angle, your y value flips from positive to negative and vice versa. And then that's also the fact that it's an odd function that allows you to change that. Now cosecant, so that is the reciprocal of sine. So that is... 1 over sine of negative t. So I'm just writing this out because you don't want to, you want to make sure you're using the right value, that you're taking the reciprocal of sine of negative t, not sine of t, because we have cosecant of negative t. 
So since sine of t is 3 over 8, the reciprocal of that is 8 over 3. So that means the cosecant of negative t is 8 over 3. And I don't care where these are on the unit circle. I'm just using the fact of how the unit circle works to figure these out. For any questions? And it's the reciprocal, not the sign. The sign stays just doing the reciprocal. Yes. That'll be the one little thing I have to remind myself as well. <laughs> yeah, it's those negatives and positives that get everybody. Okay, now this is my final example, evaluating using a calculator. And so I'm going to temporarily stop sharing so that I can show you the calculators um, and do my best to put this on the, um, you know, I've got both my calculators here. So I'm going to start with the, the simple one that I have here, the 30x2. So um, getting this really close, there's this button that says DRG. That changes from degree mode to radian mode. And you can tell what mode you're in. There's this really tiny, so mine says rad. So that means it's in radian mode. And that's the mode we want. So we're always going to be in radian mode unless you see the degree symbol, the little circle in the upper right. Then you'll be in degree mode. So um, once you're in radian mode and you're in the right mode, then I have sine, cosine, and tangent buttons. And so you literally just push the button and enter it in just like it looks on a piece of paper. Now, on my graphing calculator here, so I have the 89. So this is not exactly like the 83 or the 84, but um, again, there is little tiny font here if you can see it, but it says rad, which means it's in radian mode, which is the mode that I want. And if you want to change modes, I gotta remember how to do that. Because I normally I'm never in degree mode. Um, how do I change this mode? There we go. Okay. I really have a mode button. <laughs> but if I hit the mode button, then it gives me these options. And then I can scroll down, and there is one for angle. And then from there, you can change it from radian to degree. Now, because mostly everything we do is radians, I never actually changed that, so that's why I didn't even know where it was. Instead, if I have anything in degree, I actually have a little degree symbol in blue right over here. So if I want to enter in anything with degrees, I just use my second button and this little degree symbol so that I can enter in the degrees and I don't have to change my mode. Um, so that's what I do on this calculator. If you have an 83, I think... It might be similar. Um, I'm just going to do a quick Google search. Um, okay. Both my yeah, so. computer calculator and my smartphone have the degree radian button just visible. If I flip it sideways, it puts it in scientific mode. Perfect. So then you don't oh. even need. Yeah, that's good. Let's see. And in the it looks like on the TI-83 on this Google. I just search I just did, which is how I find out how to do anything. There is a mode button, and then it, it works the same way. And then there actually is a degree symbol. It's under second apps and one. But if somebody has the 83, they want to know how to do that, I would just Google it because it was like the first link that I found. So it was really super easy to find that out. So now knowing how to do that on your calculator, we're going to go back to my my slide here. So we're going to evaluate these using a, a calculator. And when you're doing it on a calculator, you don't have to worry about negative signs, positive signs, or whatever. The calculator is just going to do that. So you just literally enter it in. So I have my cosine button, and then I just type in negative 2.8. And then you're going to get a really nasty decimal value. Um, and this is the downside of doing it on the calculator, is that most trig functions don't give nice answers. The only ones that do are those special ones that are listed on the unit circle. If it's not listed on the unit circle, you're going to get nasty numbers. So I get, 
oh, I have a zero, negative, that's important. I don't want to forget my negative sign. So negative 0 0.9422223421. That's what my calculator lists. So you want to make sure you get that same zero answer. Seven. <clears throat> you have 0, 07? Wait, what? Where your 1 is. Mine, mine goes one more decimal place ah. out from 0, 07. Okay, which then rounds up to 1. Yeah, see, that's Correct. the same. That, yes. So that it does depend on what calculator. I wonder what my graphing calculator says. My graphing calculator gives me any even fewer. It just stops at the twos. Now, we will only work with the first four digits. So we're going to just round this off. So one, two, three, four. So that two. So we don't have to round up or anything. So we'll just say this is negative 0 0.9422. So we're just four decimal places. Everybody should agree at four decimal places. So the next one is tangent of five pi over seven. So if possible, you want to use the pi button on your calculator because if you don't, if you round pi to 3.14, you're going to get a different answer. So I have a pi button on both of my calculators. Um, I think most calculators these days have that button. So I can enter it exactly as it says, tangent, and then in parentheses, 5 pi divided by 7. And you want to make sure that all of that is in parentheses. And you get negative 1.2539603338. It may differ in the last couple digits there. And just for reference, if you only typed in 3.14, just to show you how it differs. So using pi about 3.14, you get negative 1.25689. So when you're looking at the first four digits, that's a much different number. Um, it, you know, and we're looking at four decimal places. So that would be a big difference considering four decimal places. So don't use 3.14. Use your pi button. If you don't have a pi button, I think, let me see how many decimal places will get it close enough. Um, if you use pi about to 3.14952, then you will get it close. And you'll get it close enough that the first four digits are the same. So if you don't have a pi button, you're going to have to use more decimals of pi in order to get the same value. I have a pi button, so I'm just using that. Makes it really easy. So when I round this to four decimal places, because I, I put the line with my four decimal places. The six after that means I have to round up. So that nine rounds up to a 10. So that 10, that one rounds the three up to a four, and then I have a zero. So this actually rounds to negative 1.2540. Been seeing a lot of people making rounding errors on, errors on the assignment. So I wanna make sure that we make sure we're all rounding the same way. So in our assignments, you want us to round to four decimal places then? Yes. Yeah, that is the, the standard one we do with usually anything where you have like natural log, exponents, sine and cosine, we use four decimal places. T and four. So that is my last example. Are there any questions about evaluating these with a calculator? No, luckily, actually, the smartphone is fairly intuitive on mine, so. Perfect. Yeah, I always forget that I have this calculator on my phone, and I think most of the time these calculators are now roughly the same. And I think I have a, yeah, let's see. Yeah, and I have a pi button on my calculator on my phone. So then, yeah, so that's actually, yeah, sine, cosine, uh, yep, radian degree, degree mode. Yeah, smartphones these button, days can do it screen. all. You've got you've got everything you need, and it even has a button to take the reciprocal. So that's yeah, I have that do. thing too. I've got sine negative one, cosine negative one, tangent negative mm -hmm. one. 
Cool. Cosine of H. Cosine of H and the reciprocals of those, too. So. I just discovered that my calculator does unit conversions. <laughs> wow. Well, that's a fun thing. <laughs> Didn't know it did that. All right. Um, any other questions? None right now. Like I said, I haven't, you know, I haven't even, this is my first look at the stuff for this week. So luckily it's a holiday for me. So I'll have a three day weekend. That I can mm. really put some time into it, hopefully, and knock yeah. it out. We have Monday off, but not tomorrow. But I'm working from home tomorrow because we're supposed to get a bad ice storm and I'm not going to drive in that. So. <laughs> All right. Yes, that's not a problem down here. I think we're going to be in the seven yeah, tomorrow. So. Oh, that's really nice. That was, <laughs> it was definitely it, very cold wind this morning. I was like, oh, I'm not prepared for this. <laughs> right. Well, thank you for attending and participating and asking questions. And uh, let me know if you have other questions as you work through the homework and everything. All right. Will do. All right. Thank you. you have a great night. You're welcome. Thank you. You too.